Broadcasting Authority of Zimbabwe announced the entrance of six more television stations in November 2020. It was met with a lukewarm reception from both the public and journalists. The awarding of six licenses to private players is expected to end the state broadcaster's effective four-decade monopoly over television broadcasting. The Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation, inherited from colonial Rhodesia, has maintained its lone, really challenged presence in television airwaves. The spotlight has moved to the new license holders, who are, in many ways, linked to the ruling ZANU-PF and the military. The consensus is that it is yet another episode of media capture. In this documentary, we explore how changes in the media in Zimbabwe have an all-too-familiar ring to them. The battle for the control of the media casts a very long shadow dating back to the Rhodesian days into an independent Zimbabwe. The ruling political class remains a menacing threat to journalism. We also ask if there is genuine pushback from the digital news platforms. In 2006, Dumisani Mulia won the CNN Report of the Year Award for covering the takeover of an independent newspaper, the Daily Mirror, by state intelligence. Muleya is convinced media capture is widespread in Zimbabwean media. If you look at the history of the media, uh, part of uh, the media in Zimbabwe, particularly the public media or the state-controlled media, uh, it was born captured. The roots of uh, uh, the public media where they are looking at Zim papers, where they are looking at uh, the state broadcasters, ZBC, uh, formed under the Rhodesians. They formed them exclusively to promote their agenda of the time, which is the agenda of the regime to defend itself against the rising nationalist sentiment by the majority who wanted uh, not just reform, but change. So that media, uh, its genesis, it was established and founded in structures that were designed to serve the ruling elite of the time, not to serve the public interest as it were. Yes, of course, um, uh, from time to time on the surface of it, they will cover some issues that look like they are uh, issues of public interest. But in terms of how they are structured, how they are controlled and run, they are captured beyond reasonable doubt. They get they are mandates, not from the public that they are supposed to save. That is in terms of their operational mandate. They get their mandate from politicians, uh, from Munumutapa building there, who usually use uh, what are illegal means clearly, to reach out to editors, to reach out to editorial structures in order to impose uh, their own um, narrow agendas. The narrow agendas that the media are forced to pursue attract scathing labels. Dr. Leighton Mube is a media academic. Among other things, he researches the political economy of the media. He says the capture of public media has introduced some of the worst forms of journalism. What we are witnessing at the, at the moment, for instance, if I look at how uh, the publicly owned or the so-called the, the third control media uh, operate, I have noted with deep concern that perhaps they tend to practice. In the past, uh, uh, academics like the late Terence Ranger, they dubbed uh, terms like uh, patriotic journalism, but perhaps it goes beyond patriotic journalism. What we are witnessing perhaps is commissariat journalism. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, the, 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 the media, or, or these media institutions, they have been reduced to perhaps uh, in the West African nation, nations, they talk about the, the griotic tradition. They are more of griots, they are more of parodies of power. They are more of a uh, psychophants, uh, which are always uh, singing uh, praises, uh, but uncritically uh, engaging with key issues. And they, they are failing to rise to the occasion. That's, I, that's why I was saying, we, we find them uh, wanting uh, when it comes to their expected role, perhaps as, as watchdogs. 
they are more of reduced to lab dogs uh, in the hands of uh, those who are, who are controlling them. Media capture is multidimensional. Those who want to control narratives have learned that they have several avenues to force their will. Exercise of power is where they begin. Legislatively, uh, you have a capture in the sense of uh, media that operates uh, on the basis of licenses, particularly broadcasting. Uh, we saw a recent broadcasting um, process that yielded to all in intents and purposes licenses to people that are either directly connected to the ruling ZANU-PF or they are associated with the ruling ZANU-PF. Or indeed, if they are not publicly associated, they've cut deals with the ZANU-PF. So that constitutes capture because uh, the licenses are issued on conditionalities, on certain understandings. They may not be written down, but they understood that uh, basically in this country, there is no genuinely private broadcast. I'm sorry to say, I know other comrades are trying very hard to open up the electronic uh, space and the airwaves to alternative views. But the reality is that there are no genuinely independent broadcasters in this country. Broadcasting is a contested media space in Zimbabwe. The ruling ZANU-PF has prevailed. The question of how matters as much as why. Broadcasts are the cheapest to consume and more widespread in their reach. Newspapers are relatively expensive and they are a luxury of urban populations. Electoral power in Zimbabwe lies in rural areas, which is where the majority lives. The ruling party knows this and controlling political narratives requires a grip on the airwaves. If a direct dominant monopoly is no longer sustainable, then you can rely on friends to pull a facade of multiple players. If you look at the number of uh, radio stations that have been licensed and are actually under Zim papers, and I think this one I have to stress also because it relates directly to, you know, just the politics around the licensing of broadcasting players. You will remember that at the time that Nyami Nyami uh, FM in um, Kariba was licensed, it felt like it was an independent commercial radio. But later on, it emerged that uh, Nyami Nyami was under Zim Papers together with Capital FM. So you continue to see an expansion, but at the other, on the other side, you're seeing that it's actually a consolidation uh, of concentration of ownership of the media among a few um, you know, powerful individuals. Another thing that I should say also that we need to think carefully about is also just um, that this capture is consolidated in the existing media legislation that we had and we see we have and we see this particularly with the broadcasting services uh, act which doesn't actually provide for the independence in terms of you know the structure or the people who are actually licensing um, these uh, entities yes we're celebrating to uh, television the licensing of television uh, players but one of them as you can see is Rusununguko media trading who we are we hear is the army so this is like a consolidation of existing uh, political power and definitely it will affect the agenda um, of the media. So definitely the media is captured in Zimbabwe. You must have a government that calls uh, for the application um, of licensing because this is a, this is a, a finite resource. A spectrum is quite finite. So if you see a government calling for, for licensing, itself as a government should not be a beneficiary. Uh, why? Because the government is supposed to be uh, this arbiter, this um, you know, provider of free space for various players. But if you see a situation whereby in one end the government calls for licensing uh, and through its various uh, formations stampede um, other citizens from uh, accessing that same licensing regime, then we have got a serious problem. That's what we have seen in the, in the last set of licensing, be it radio, be it television, uh, a, a tightening of grip of the ruling class. Uh, so it is a by and large uh, uh, plurality without diversity. The contestations that uh, have always been there in the political field 
has spilled to virtually every sector, you name it. It could be in sport, it could be in religion itself. We've had the factional fights in terms of our political affiliation and whether you are in alignment with ZANU-PF or the political opposition MDC. And uh, the media have not been spared such uh, contestations. So I'm saying perhaps the best measurement of whether the media in the mainstream are performing to the expectations of the people can be when we look at critical issues that need to be deb deb debated or discussed and whether these are being given space and time in the media, regardless of the ownership. I would say, for instance, a good test measure would be uh, the licensees, those who have been given licenses, making sure that their organizations are giving ample attention to the scourge of COVID-19. Are they giving ample attention to incidences of corruption and maladministration, regardless of ownership? That's the public service and the public good that I'm talking about. So when we talk about media capture, it becomes frightening. The word capture itself, quite often you think of abduction. Abducted from whom? Is it from the public interest, from the public good? So if, for instance, the Zimbabwean government decides to give people that are sympathetic to it licenses, and those people go on to save the public good and the public interest, I will have no qualms about that, no problems about that. You've seen the licensing of new TV stations, uh, the licensing of new uh, community radio stations, uh, but you look at those the, the TV stations, for example, um, the armies uh, in, in, in involved in various uh, of those TV stations, and most of those new independent TV stations have some link to ZANU-PF. Um, uh, it's even true of some of the of the community radio stations. So I think there's there's there, there, there's definitely been a huge pattern of media capture over the last year. Um, and that is, goes from radio to TV to uh, to legacy media. And I think and I, and I think that really leaves the, <clears throat> the the you know the the online space, the digital space uh, as the freest space, uh, the most independent space uh, uh, and the space with the most alternative media in Zimbabwe at the moment. Private media in Zimbabwe are known to have a strong dissenting voice. Unlike the state media that has outrightly positioned itself towards a brazenly pliant editorial stance, private media accommodates critical voices. However, the dynamics have been changing in that sector as well. When you look at um, the mainstream media, having spoken about the state media, you look at the private media organizations, uh, I will not uh, uh, really um, uh, check them by names there, but I will tell you that uh, they are compromised very severely, compromised politically, compromised commercially, they are compromised by licenses. So you have a, a media that is mainstream media in this country that is no longer serving the genuine interest of the public or the public interest that is uh, constrained and compromised by their operating environment, uh, which is characterized by political uh, pressures, commercial pressures, and indeed legislative pressures. There's another impediment uh, which obviously uh, has to do with the, the broader economic uh, spectrum, the broader economic uh, sector as it were with its uh, challenges, inflation, uh, unpredictability, lack of investor confidence, and, and, and so forth. What you also now have had Whitley uh, resources and what that it has a ripple effect because what you then have is you either have is in our case a media that is have heavily reliant on the 
the state and its actors, or a media that becomes heavily reliant on capital? How then does uh, the media play effectively its watch to grow uh, independently and freely uh, if uh, it is uh, operating under uh, such difficult conditions? Uh, how then does it hold uh, the state to, 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 to account, the government to account, when it is heavily reliant on uh, 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 the, the, the tokens of government, or when it is heavily reliant on one or two advertisers? It's healthy to have as many uh, businesses doing well in the country, uh, such that there is multiple actors. The tough economic environment poses more than advertising and revenue challenges. A much more sinister media capture tactic is becoming much clearer. To introduce the dangerous dynamic that we are seeing now being more prevalent, uh, the issue of equity uh, or hostile takeover. Uh, th th this didn't start now because uh, you must uh, look at what happened to the, to the, to the mirror of uh, Ibo Mandasa. It's, it's a simple case of uh, a state that says, no, no, we need to silence the media. How do we ensure that equity is used as a trap? Uh, when equity is injected, they, 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 they effect a hostile takeover of editorial independence. That is highly pronounced today. Uh, as you see that uh, uh, the, the media uh, of yesteryear, which was highly pronounced on certain issues, uh, which was so cunning in terms of uh, coverage and reportage, strong editorial independence loses the only tool at its disposal, which is the editorial independence. And this is achieved through capture. Uh, and and uh, without naming uh, people, you can see that uh, uh, issues of press freedom, they are not isolated to the struggles of the day. Uh, the struggles of the day, including uh, issues of uh, women rights, uh, issues of uh, students' rights, uh, issues of uh, workers' rights, uh, issues of democracy, uh, issues of uh, access to health, access to education, among other things. So part of it is to ensure that... Uh, as you heard uh, the president saying, we have diffused uh, the opposition. Part of it is also to dis diffuse the multiple layers of struggles uh, that have been encountered by different centers, including the media. Uh, and in, in this chain, uh, it's the use of uh, uh, equity uh, to, to disable editorial uh, independence on behalf of those that have been critical uh, or holding dissenting views. Um, a strong reportage, uh, especially that promoted accountability. If the struggles of the media are not removed from the broader political struggles of the day, what does it say about the state of governance? And what of press freedom? What you have is an executive seriously conflated with the legislator and by extension, the judiciary. So what essentially what you have before we even speak of media capture is that capture the state has been captured uh, uh, by uh, in Zimbabwe, in the case of Zimbabwe, by the, the by the ruling elite who uh, control the the, 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 the executive. Uh, I think there is one clip and. Uh, um, one, uh, uh, I think it was uh, uh, President Munangagwa addressing uh, a political rally where he, he proudly and unequivocally, uh, you know, said that they are the army, they are the police. We must be respected. We are majority. We are the people. We are the government. We are the army. We are the air force. We are the police. We are everything you can think of. Media institutions are clearly in a precarious position. They contend with multiple forms of capture. Journalists and their journalism are also at the center of focus. You see now when we were doing, um, in, in being inducted initially into journalism, one of the things was that you had to set an agenda. Um, and obviously that agenda is set by going to sit down and going through an editorial meeting where you uh, rec you recognize your role as a public entity and your responsibility in the dissemination of news that is ethically 
um, you know, recognized in terms of a balance, in terms of also being able to understand that whatever is making the news at that time, there needs to be a varying opinion so that the product that you're taking out to the people is a product that will allow them to make a certain decision. So you, the media is supposed to actually empower uh, people in terms of there's content that's viewing a governance system, there's content that's uh, viewing an economic uh, trend in the country, but what are the varying opinions? We're not seeing a balance in the news. Um, we already know that if I want to have news content that is pro-government or will be a mouthpiece for, for the government. So if you look at the state media's reporting now, very rarely do you have objective analysis. If you find, find comment by a specific political analyst, it's going to be embedded in the preferred political um, you know, ideology that a newspaper uh, follows. Similarly, if you want op um, an opinion that's going to you know, uh, be in line with the opposition, you obviously need to go to a more independent um, newspaper. Right now, the other topical issue is around a deplorable ethical uh, considerations when it comes to the operations of the media, where you see that there's a clear disregard for fundamental uh, adherence to fundamental uh, ethical considerations when it comes to reportage, issues related to balance, accuracy, fairness, and the likes, you find that there is clear disregard of that because of this issue of capture and this quest to always present uh, news and information uh, through uh, exploring a certain angle or through reinforcing or, or, or presenting new biases uh, that a certain media house or journalist seeks to, to, to present. You also find that as a result of this capture, there's also the, the rampant rise in issues of disinformation, misinformation, and fake news. Perhaps beyond market capture and state capture, what we are witnessing perhaps is what I would want to term voluntary capture. It, I think to, to an extent, our journalists are submitting themselves to different kinds of, kinds of capture, uh, perhaps as a result of the vocal environment that uh, we, 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 we have been witnessing, especially uh, in contemporary times. Uh, from last year to this year, uh, we, we have witnessed uh, uh, the cost of living. It continues to continuously uh, uh, sinking deeper into the doldrums. So perhaps journalists are somehow voluntarily submitting themselves uh, to, to, to different kinds of captures perhaps so that they can receive a, a number of freebies so that they can receive bribes, they can receive brown envelopes. So this kind of capture at the end of the day uh, result in journalists being blind tools in the ends of corruption. So we find this unworthy alliance, this kind of collusion, which is prevailing, it's quite symbiotic, but the, 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 the benefits are quite mutual for the benefactors and their tools. Of late, you will see that there is a huge um, emergence of uh, new startups in the media. It's, it's a result not just of technological developments and the digital revolution that is going on. It's also a result of the compromise of the mainstream media that has led uh, to the mushrooming of new startups, which are trying to push back against this state capture. The mushrooming of digital news startups is a shift in the balance of narrative power away from established institutions to more diverse voices. At least, that is how it is imagined by those who are optimistic about these changes. It remains to be seen if digital media spaces can hold the fort, facilitate dialogue, and help build a formidable civil society as it is currently under attack. Over the past five years, we have seen uh, a slow pace change in terms of uh, media, media ownership uh, um, strengths, uh, media ownership uh, ch changes, and uh, we have also recorded um, a, a big number uh, of uh, uh, fragmentation from those who are formerly employed in these big uh, institutions, uh, that is traditional media, uh, and the emergence of the new media. Uh, that is utilizing uh, the, the 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 growth of the internet in Zimbabwe. So we 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 now have the, what what some others in other spheres uh, spheres have called uh, startup media. Uh, this is um, 
small but effective type of media that has broken the probably uh, the most serious stories uh, of the turn of our uh, our millennium. Uh, that is your 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 issue of uh, the COVID nineteen scandals, uh, the issues of uh, how the military was going to do thrown uh, the then founding head of state etc so this is type of um, an evolution um, not revolutionary per se but evolutionary uh, in that um, uh, because of uh, the changing models of the media we are seeing an emergence of a new crop of media that's the real new battleground um, and 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 the new battleground of of, of of ideas the new battleground around how to build the new participatory democracy um, and you see that in terms of the, the, the players that are on there, I think, you know, uh, players like, like uh, Zim Live, who are, you know, very much uh, setting the pace in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, you know, the, the recent uh, revelations about Kembo Mohadi uh, or Newshawks with their fantastic investigative journalism. Um, others like Hopal Chingono and the, the, the work that he does in, in exposing corruption. So many of you know the, the kind of the agenda setting the trend setting in our journalism now that's forcing politicians to respond is is in the online space uh, i think you see that you know all the way through to young you know your younger content creators and startups your likes of 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 of, of bus stop tv who use their humor to speak truth to power all of these you know i think the most uh, the most important uh, content creators um, uh, we, we we find the majority of them online. So I think that's that's the new yeah the new uh, battleground of uh, of ideas um, and a space that we really have to uh, you know pr protect and make sure we keep it free. We sort of want to believe that there's an expansion with the digital media. Uh, the environment has changed slightly because we have more independent bloggers and people who are producing uh, content online. But we need to understand that they don't just survive by just channeling out that news. You will find that a lot of the, the, new, the online platforms uh, with the Zimbabwean content that are you know, popular also do command or pull draw in a lot of um, revenue through advertising by more you know prominent players within the economic environment so what you find is those um, those uh, online media platforms are more inclined to be politically correct as well but they are also aligned to a more business sort of reporting so there's no critic around corruption it's more standardized news, which is more reporting on events. And also there's a lot of replication of mainstream media content. So you'll find a lot of these platforms online will be carrying a story that's already been run on in the Herald or in the Newsday. So as much as we also want to start looking about the digital, uh, looking at the digital media environment as being a form of diversity and also, you know, just running away from the capture of the main mainstream media, we are not seeing much of a difference. COVID is going to be with us, some predictions say in Zimbabwe, even up until 2024. So I think we'll, we'll be in, existing in, uh, in a reality where it's, you know, it's semi-physical, semi-virtual. And so I think the, start, the media startups um, that have thrived under the lockdown in getting important information out there to people um, are going to be even more critical uh, post-COVID, uh, and much better at dealing with the new normal than uh, cumbersome, big legacy media organizations. Tabani Moya believes that there is still room for discussion with the government. He says COVID-19 has left the media much more vulnerable, and the government has to facilitate media resilience. For us, we have written to the to the government already to say we we need to have a, a professional approach uh, towards the rescuing the media, a holistic approach uh, of rescuing the media. Media firstly, propose a media rescue package um, as a government. It doesn't mean that you have to pour in money. Yes, money you need to use. No, no, no. Uh, just like what happens with the politi political you know centers when when an opposition party has a presence in parliament. 
you use fiscus uh, to support and strengthen the role of opposition in that country. So that is what we are saying with the press. You, you want a, a vibrant press to ensure that uh, humanity does not slide back uh, to the Stone Age polity uh, and Stone Age era uh, of existence. So the government can then set aside uh, a revolving fund with the low interest rates that the media can tap in to maintain resilience. That's the first one. The second one is that the media uh, has got a multiple taxation uh, regime uh, that, that, that governs it in Zimbabwe. Uh, they, they contribute too many levies to too many fragmented bodies. Uh, if you are in the media, it's, it's one way or the other, you shall contribute to the uh, media development fund through the, 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 the then repealed IPA. Uh, you would then you know, contribute to the, the broadcasting development fund uh, through BSA. You would contribute to the uh, universal services fund through the use of uh, telecom signal. Um, you contribute directly through levies uh, to the state. Uh, there's a 2%, there's this percentage, there's that percentage, all hemorrhaging um, the media industry. And above all, they, they impose these taxes not on profitability, uh, not on profits of the, the, the media organizations, but on, 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 on revenue. So it means that uh, the, the, the media is suffocated from multiple angles. Hence, the government needs to review and effect moratoriums, tax moratoriums to the media. That when you have recovered, well, then we are going to give you within this next five years, we are going to cut uh, your contributions through levies. Um, and then also consolidate these fragmented boards uh, of, of, of revenue collection within the media for developmental purposes. Uh, and ensure that you stimulate media growth from, because these are the media industry structures that have uh, contributed so much uh, to these revenue pockets. Now they're in strain. Utilize the same uh, pockets to ensure that uh, they are resilient. Back in 2004, media academic Dumisani Mboyo published an article on broadcasting policy reform and political control from Rhodesia to Zimbabwe. He asked if there was a change without change in the media. It is 2021. There have been so many changes in the media since he published his piece. The media capture question is still asked today. Have these media plurality changes brought any change in the diversity of voices? Clearly not. Thank you.